In this section, we're going to talk about some special features of the NMR spectrum that you should be aware of. Some things like solvents, alcohol peaks, and things like that. First, let's look at the NMR solvent. For NMR, deuterated solvents are typically used. What a deuterated solvent is, is it's one where all the hydrogens in the molecule have been replaced by deuterium. And the reason for that is because deuterium absorptions aren't detected in the range that we use for proton NMR. So that 0 to 12 range, deuterium doesn't show up. One of the most common NMR solvents is chloroform D, CdCl3. And its non-deuterated counterpart is CHCl3. So you can imagine if you have a few milligrams of sample and then you dissolve that in half a mil of regular chloroform, what's going to happen is that's going to completely overpower the signal of your compound of interest because you're going to see a huge peak due to the huge concentration of hydrogen and chloroform and then your compound that you're looking at is just going to get buried into the baseline of the spectrum. So that's why we use these essentially NMR inert solvents where the hydrogen is replaced by deuterium. So there's a few different options. Uh, you have deuterated acetone. Here's the deuterated version of water. Deuterated methanol where both the deuterium on the carbon and on the OH is replaced and then this deuterated DMSO. All right, here's an NMR spectrum. Uh, this is just of ethyl acetate. And we have our three signals corresponding to ethyl acetate here, here, and here. And this sample was run in chloroform as a solvent. And you'll see to the left, there's a bottle of chloroform. And you'll notice that the deuterium content is 99.8%. What that means is there's a very, very tiny amount of CHCl3 in the solvent. That tiny amount of regular chloroform will show up in the spectrum. And the chemical shift for that hydrogen on CHCl3 is right around 7.26. So that's why if you look down here around 7 in the spectrum, we see this small blip. And that is the chloroform solvent peak. And that actually often provides a useful reference because we know chloroform always shows up at 7.26. So we can just set our NMR spectrum once it's run. We set this particular peak at 7.26 and then everything else falls into place from that. We just talked about using your solvent peak as the reference by which all your other signals are based upon but there's actually an even better reference or internal standard that can be used. And that is tetramethylsilene, TMS. The structure of TMS is shown right here, and you'll see that we have the four methyl groups on the silicon, and this has a chemical shift right at zero. So in many cases, your solvent will already be spiked with a small amount of TMS. So you can buy bottles of chloroform D plus 0.1% TMS in the sample. And what that does is that gives you this small peak right at zero. So you take your NMR spectrum and then you find the peak that's close to zero and you set that as TMS directly at zero, then that normalizes all the other peaks in the spectrum. And you can see this uh, particular NMR was taken in chloroform. We can see the CHCl3 peak right here. 
So if you see a peak right at zero, don't think that's part of your sample. It is merely uh, the internal standard. There's a useful and interesting experiment you can do with alcohols in your sample, and that's called a D2O shake. So in the spectrum on top here, this is just propanol. And you'll see that um, you know, we're, it's clearly visible. We have our CH2 signals, our CH3, and then this wider singlet is the OH. But this is a pretty simple molecule. In some cases, you may have multiple singlets and you're not sure which one is your OH, or you're not even entirely sure that you have an OH. One way to test this is to do what's known as a D2O shake. So you would first take your alcohol and run an NMR and get the NMR spectrum of the compound. Then you add this deuterium oxide to your NMR tube and shake it up. What that does is it causes a proton exchange between the OH and the deuterium in the deuterated water. And that's going to replace the hydrogen on the alcohol with deuterium, making that signal go away. So then you run a second NMR, and you'll notice now the OH peak has disappeared. So that allows you to confirm which peak in your original NMR spectrum was the alcohol. One last thing that you should know that is uncommon, but it does happen occasionally, is you can sometimes get splitting or coupling through an OH signal. And most of the time, you know, we say that OHs are brought in singlets, but it is possible to get split OH peaks. And that's actually what we see right here corresponding to this OH. This happens when your sample is very pure and completely dry. Most of the time your sample is going to have a little bit of water in it, uh, which causes proton exchange between the water and the OH, and that results in collapse of any splitting into just a singlet. But here's a spectrum where um, it's very pure, it's completely dry, and we actually see this OH does split because of its neighboring proton. So the neighboring proton is on this carbon right here, and we have one proton, so N plus one is two, and that OH does split into a doublet. Again, you don't see this a lot, but it is possible. So you can't always just say that an OH has to be a singlet.